Um, Welcome, uh, I'm Olga Olaker. I direct the Russia and Eurasia program uh, here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Um, before we get started, just a quick administrative note. Um, exit signs are uh, behind and before both you and me in case of any emergency. I will provide any additional instructions, but we do have an official assembly point in front of the National Geographic building. If you walk out the front door, make a left and make another left. Um, but there won't be any emergencies, um, I predict, um, other than the one that has been going for several years now, which we'll be discussing today. Uh, which is the crisis in Ukraine. Um, I'm really pleased to, to have the opportunity to present this um, this report because uh, it um, the the conveners of this project did something of which there's fairly little, which is to bring together uh, not just um, Russians and Americans or Europeans, and not just Americans and Europeans with Ukrainians, but to bring West, folks representing the United States. Um, EU countries, Russia, and Ukraine together to talk about this. And I'm going to let our speakers tell you what they did, uh, how they did it, and what they came up with. Um, because we have a lot of folks, I'm just going to quickly introduce and, um, and we can get started. So um, I'll go this way. Um, so um, Gregory Brown is an adjunct uh, professor um, and senior analyst at uh, Centra Technology. He served as uh, the designer of this process, and he's going to tell us a little bit about um, how, how, this was, uh, how this was all done, because it is kind of a, a, neat, uh, a neat process for coming up with the conclusions. Next uh, to Gregory is Julie Organis, who's a visiting scholar with the Russian Eurasia Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And she's going to be providing commentary on um, what we hear from uh, the report's authors on, on the report. Uh, next to me is His Excellency Alexander Chali, who's the former um, First Deputy, Prime, First Deputy Minister for Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, um, State Secretary for European Integration, and uh, former Foreign Policy Advisor to the President of Ukraine, uh, currently President of Grant Thornton in Ukraine. Um, to my left uh, is Sam Cherup, Senior Political Scientist at the RAND Corporation in Washington, D.C., and one of the organizers of this effort. Uh, next to Sam is Alexei Simeni, who is Director of the Institute for Global Transformations in Kiev, and also a former um, member of the staff of the Foreign Policy Department of the Presidential Administration of Ukraine. And finally, last but not least, uh, Reinhard Krum, who heads the Regional Office for Cooperation and peace uh, in Vienna for um, uh, Friedrich Ebert Sittung. Um, and he's also a lecturer on Russian history at Regensburg University in Germany. And he's going to um, do a brief introduction of the project before we turn the floor over to Gregory. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for all joining us here today. This is a brief introduction I would like to make. We started this project in 2016. It was an idea of Sam Sharp, and then we sat together and were wondering if it would be a good idea, if it would be a good idea to do a scenario project on Ukraine. The Ebert Foundation has done that before. It was called the European Union and the East, and under the East we understood Russia and the countries of the Eastern Partnership. But this one is only on Ukraine. Um, it was very important for us also to have participants clearly from the Ukraine, and you see a couple of them here, but we also had um, other participants, and you can see that here. Uh, they're from Germany, um, from Slovakia, from the US, from Russia, and clearly from Ukraine. Um, what is the purpose of this scenario project? I mean, the context is clear. I don't think I have to explain that. Um, the idea of scenarios, and Greg will go into that further, is that you come up, in this case, with four scenarios. Clearly, usually, you have a very bad one and a very good one, and then you have two in-betweens. And these two in-betweens are interesting in how far, where are we now, and where do we want to go. So the idea is to present this also to politicians and see if we agree on a scenario where we basically are to make sure that we're not sliding down to the worst case scenario, and what are the ways to come up with a better scenario. 
Um, this worked fine with the ones we have done before, and this methodology of scenarios is nothing new. But here, it was quite um, challenging on a subject which, which is clearly extremely emotional. And we went through different phases, and I'm sure Greg will tell you all about it. At the very end, we came up with two factors which are domestic policies in Ukraine. And that's what we're here for, to talk about it. Clearly, we don't miss the international uh, factors, uh, Russia first of all, but not only. But in this case, we wanted to look at Ukraine. We have presented the scenarios so far in Berlin, in Brussels, um, in Kiev, in Moscow. This is the fifth um, city, and we're going from here to Ottawa, and then we'll end in Prague and Warsaw. So far, we had, which is not a surprise, especially in Kiev, in, uh, in Kiev and in uh, Moscow, extremely intense discussions. And um, I think we're very much looking forward to have this discussion with you. We very well understand that most of the fun we had is within the group because the discussions were extremely tense there too. So um, we're delighted that you're here. We understand that apart from the uh, content, you can ask many questions concerning the methodology. That's why we invited Greg <laughs> to tell us all about it. It's not done for the first time and clearly not for the last time. Our wish would be that you just agree on those four scenarios in terms of that's what they are and let's have a discussion based on those, because that was the biggest discussion we had in all the four capitals so far. Why don't you have scenario Y, Z? Yes, we could have others too, but we decided these four could be interesting to discuss. So I think uh, this is for a very small introduction. I would like to end with the fact that we are kind of looking towards these discussions also in different countries, in different capitals, to make out of those ideas a small policy paper. Clearly, Chatham House, nobody will be quoted, but the discussion in a couple of different countries make the scenarios, we think, um, even more valuable than just putting the publication out. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going to turn the floor over to Gregory Brown to tell us how the magic happened. Great. Thank you, Olga. And thank you, Reinhardt and Sam, for bringing me aboard with this project. As a preface, I should let you know that I am in no way an expert on Ukraine. I knew almost nothing about it when I went to the first meeting other than what you can read in the New York Times, but I learned a lot. So I was brought in to walk the, the invited participants through a methodology to, again, to come up with four scenarios. So the first thing that I want to do is just explain to you how we approach this and to tell you what we were trying to do and what we were not trying to do. Um, which hopefully will help uh, us understand how we came up with four very distinct possible futures. The first thing is that scenarios themselves are just one approach for dealing with an uncertain future and a useful way for considering how a set of uncertainties may play out over multiple pathways as told through a, a number of short stories because that's how we remember things. And they help us to uh, challenge some unstated assumptions that we might have as well as any prejudice assessments we might have about the future based upon our present circumstance and what we believe our current trends. Uh, moreover, an advantage of drafting multiple scenarios as opposed to one scenario or a single grand strategy is that we find that multiple scenarios provide more clarity to decision makers, more choices to decision makers, and to an expert community interested in Ukraine's choices moving forward over the next 10 years. It's also true that the scenarios will help us identify possible effects of those choices for that future and for other interested parties beyond Ukraine. As we built the scenarios, what we wanted to do was select, and I think we did a great job doing this, a high-level group of Russians, Europeans, Americans, Ukrainians, and a handful of others, and brought them together on two different occasions, for two days uh, for each meeting, and we developed these four long-term scenarios that Reinhardt has introduced to us. During the first meeting in Potsdam in uh, April of 2016, uh, we began with a general discussion about Ukraine, its present, uh, recent trends, current trends, possible future trends, noticeable trends. 
we asked a lot of our participants. We knew that we were going to be moving into a realm of speculation and pushing them into uh, some serious discussions about what is possible and to ask them to use more imagination than we usually do so. So we wanted to start with those current trends to uh, make sure that we were starting from a common baseline among our group, knowing that we were very shortly going to be pushing uh, the group beyond our comfort zones and into the imagined futures. So after a half day's discussion of the reality on the ground today and reaching some consensus on some of those issues. And through a series of brainstorming activities, the participants identified more than 75 international and domestic variables, which we believed would have some effect that we could actually measure on Ukraine's future and its relations with the United States, the European Union, and Russia. Uh, looking at things such as levels of economic growth and FDI, crime levels in the country, corruption, the state of the global economy, again, domestic, international, large and small. We looked at immigration rates, so on and so on. Anything that we thought might determine Ukraine's future. We then selected, again, through a number of series of uh, discussions and exercises, from that list of 75, two key drivers. So again, two key variables, which we found to have to match two criteria we're looking for. One is that these were the most critical, which means they had the largest effect or the most and heaviest weight or impact. And the other criteria we were looking for was that these were uncertain. So we were not sure exactly in 10 years time and we were definitely unsure exactly what was going to happen in 10 years' time or how things might turn out in 10 years' time, what the, each of these drivers was going to look like. Again, two criteria we're looking for, uncertainty and measurable effect or impact. We selected those two and we put them on a two by two. And I think you see that up here, yes, up here now. So with that, the team concluded that our two most un uncertain and critical variables are Ukraine's state, whether it was weak or strong, as well as the cohesiveness of Ukrainian society. So one is looking definitely at state institutions, the role of the state, uh, its level of uh, perforation to the public, but also what it could or could not do on its own. And then the second thing is much more general with looking at Ukrainian society, strong social cohesion, sense of identity, sense of commonality, or weak social cohesion on a number of other variables. So again, these look very broad. They're not specific things, not specific institution per se, and not necessarily a certain kind of cohesion, but we wanted to go as general as we could. And this was the two by two we came up with. So these are our two key drivers across all four scenarios. But by using four scenarios and a two by two, we do a couple of things. Uh, the first thing is you see is that we have the same key drivers across all four, so we avoid some sort of random drivers or some extreme scenarios that don't, aren't comparable to each other, so we have that. It's also true that by having this two by two, we end up with four scenarios, and as Reinhardt mentions, that tends us to give us an advantage. Usually you end up with just one scenario don't know what it looks like compared with anything else. Sometimes we want to look at three scenarios, which tends to want us to put us in a situation of looking at one good, one bad, and one sort of normal, or you end up with one positive, one negative, or two extremes and one mainstream. By looking at four, we think that we find more nuance in our scenarios. So that's what we're able to develop here. This matrix also assures that the, uh, the, each of the four scenarios we looked at are qualitatively different and yet logical, deductive, and again, they are different in non-random ways because we started with the same two key drivers. In the second event that we held, a year after the first event, we had a smaller group of participants, we invited participants from the first group as well as a couple others, and in those smaller scenarios, what our group was able to do was to flesh out each of these four quadrants. If at the end of our first uh, set of discussions, we had general topics, we had our quadrants, we had some titles, we had some sense and a sketch of what each of these four quadrants would look like. By the time we got to things a year later, we were able to send off writers in sets of two to really look at the future. Starting in 20, uh, 2027, so looking 10 years out from where we were, try to define not in this sort of brief sketch, but in a much more fleshed out way, what that world of 2027 looks like for each of these scenarios. And then working back from 2027 
to the present to determine not only possible steps of how we got from A to B to C all the way to 2027, but also the various milestones or signposts along the way. Things you could point out to uh, analysts or to policymakers, points of decision making, points of critical nature they might want to look at and revisit. It's also true that it was interesting is as you looked across the scenarios to find out which of the scenarios had certain points in common and places where they were different. So this was the methodology moving forward, and I think we're going to discuss each one of them now. Great. Right. So we are going to have one person on each panel uh, go through each of the um, each of the scenarios. So I think first is Alexei Semeny with scenario number one. Yes. Thank you, Olga. First of all, uh, good, evening, uh, good afternoon to everybody. I'm very pleased just uh, to speak on this endeavor, which was a quite interesting process, and especially when we are coming out to presentation, because you have a difference, and I'm quite curious about probable Q&A session. So first of all, I would start with general remarks. First of all, it is uh, quite a unique experience, which uh, should be repeated in some way, m probably to other issues, be it related to Ukraine, to Russia, to European Union. Some kind of foresight in current times is highly needed. And therefore, I suppose constructive critics are highly welcomed. Uh, because it's difficult now to explain many trends or some kind of paths, uh, not digging too much into details, but giving some general picture. And from this general picture, you can understood, uh, understand much more better many of the details. Uh, the second, and it was told, we selected two most crucial, but on the one hand, but on the other hand, most uncertain factors. Uh, namely strengths of Ukraine's uh, state and cohesiveness of its society. But nevertheless, uh, it was a discussion, first of all, at our first meeting about the third factor, let's call international agenda, which we excluded, but nevertheless, which plays quite a uh, good role, namely development of international environment uh, around Ukraine. First of all, it's about Russia. Uh, case. And then I would say the other second, from my perception, uh, quite important and very unpredictable uh, variable would be technological changes, namely be it digital economy, artificial intelligence and robotics or biotechnologies, which could change quite a lot and it refers not only to Ukraine but to many other issues. And then the third point I would like to uh, stress, it's actually the need to frame or even discuss Ukraine's future on expert level offering viable options, which we now quite a lot miss. Many sides are just stick to some point and uh, lose some kind of perspective. And this process should go both inside from Ukraine, of course, but from outside as well, from international expert milieu or some other groups who can propose some kind of these things. And it uh, actually, because too much now depends, be it relates to Europe, or be it, for example, for uh, Russia-US relations or Russia-West relations, too much depends on Ukraine, or Ukraine crisis, or Ukraine factor, that's why. And the next year, 2019, will be quite crucial, both from international agenda and for especially for domestic agenda of Ukraine. And then uh, I would say that uh, actually, if we talk about Ukraine and European security, uh, it shapes quite a lot. This Ukraine crisis, Ukraine development from domestic point of view, in what direction it will go, whether it will be much more going into crisis and deepening some kind um, quite divergent points, or there will be some kind uh, solution. So on the one hand, problem or threat, in the case of Ukraine, on the other, solution or possibility. So starting from scenario number one, it's about low state capacity and high social cohesion. I would say from my perspective now, more or less, uh, to majority Ukraine goes exactly this path um, and basically develops itself to this trajectory, but having elements from all of other scenarios. And now is the case to what extent uh, it will be in the final case. First of all, we suppose that it will be the case of successful decentralization an establishment of regional clusters, namely around Kyiv, Vinnytsia, Uzhgorod, Poltava, Odessa, and Lviv, whereas south and east of Ukraine uh, benefits especially from this process and thus promoting subsidiarity process. To some extent, we should say that in the last two, three years, uh, decentralization process were quite actively on the way. And now the question to what extent it will go further. The second, which we foresee, uh, it's active civil society, which pushes reforms forward, especially on local level. Then, due to the progress in economic development since 19, uh, 2019 and until 2027, um, actually, um, 
Ukraine uh, will be some kind of new model for the countries in its neighborhood, uh, I mean EU periphery, although post-communist polity in country maintains paternalistic attitudes towards state. The one only factual point, Ukraine is one of the, I suppose, two or three countries in so-called post-Soviet space, so former uh, Soviet republics, who never reached, uh, I mean, GDP level of 1990. And even until now, we did not reach, I mean, Ukraine at the level of GDP of 2013. So the gap is quite huge, but nevertheless, in this scenario, it should be overcome. The next point, we see that Ukraine is not a member of, until 2027, a member neither of EU or NATO, but closely aligned with both of the organizations. And uh, I would say that it could be some kind of new iteration of this balancing policy, which Ukraine actually to some extent consciously or not, uh, provided since 1991. If you look very carefully at all the presidents just pushing us out declarations, but looking exactly on the steps undertaken, you will see in, by all of the presidents it, will, it was more or less this balancing approach. The next point, it will be revision or modification of Minsk agreements and start of real settlement in Donbas. Now, for example, you will see it's very vivid discussion both in Ukraine and even outside on UN peacekeeping mission, or even involving OECE in this endeavor. And actually, there are some even draft papers in one of which initiative I initiated in Ukraine, going into details. How much time does it take? How many resources do we need? What are the steps? Uh, and what is the sequences of the steps, actors involved, and what are other trajectories? The next point we see, and this is actually um, until the end of this month, it will be uh, actually be we were right or not, but it was one more. It was projection of 2016. In that time, we see in 2018 preterm parliamentary elections in Ukraine. So just backsliding according to constitutionals, if until the end of June, uh, ne uh, decision is not taken, this election will not happen. Preterm parliamentary election, but let's see. A new coalition, we foresee a new power structure will be formed. It will be switched to parliamentary model where uh, president lose much of powers. Because until now it was much more mixed, be it parliamentary or presidential republic or presidential parliamentary republic. And you can see there were, I suppose, three changes of constitutions in Ukraine since uh, 1996 when constitution has been adopted, new Ukrainian. And then it was almost about the case to what extent the power are uh, uh, in favor, be it president or the parliament. Uh, the next moment in security policy, it will be start of so-called constructive ambiguity model. So de facto, accepting division lines with Crimea and occupied regions Donbas until the settlement, and support of Donbas reintegration on special, special status terms. We foresee as well in this scenario that by late 2018, so this year, Putin decides to give up rebel republics in order to revitalize relations with the West to boost economic growth in Russia and start normalization process with Ukraine. So it will be some kind of start of detente with the West. The next point, uh, which we foresee in 2019, uh, President Poroshenko will be defeated and is rare cases in all this scenario where we are quite concrete with the names and with the dates. And we invented uh, the figure of Volodymyr Karmaluk. So actually, both uh, non too much of you, I don't know whoever uh, knows about Ukraine history. The, there is a figure in the history named Karmaluk in Ukraine. It's a figure from 18th century with some steps which came uh, aligned with him. And then uh, actually, and there is indication of uh, we uh, foresee that there will be some kind of figure from the people who is on the one hand quite unknown, on the other hand, who will gain too much support because exactly the image, the person from the people. And now if you take the current rankings, which is quite unique, now two figures, which the people, uh, the socialists especially put into the rankings are not politicians, but gaining too much support. I don't know, but the names are Zelensky and Vakarchuk, both quite popular from the artist sphere, uh, not any negative image by Ukrainians, and now contemplations about to what extent these figures could be political figures, which is quite a rare case for Ukraine. Then the next, and then after defeating and establishing of the new president, new power balance will be established based once more on parliamentary republic model, 
So less authorities for president. Limitations for Sila Viki, it's taking together all this uh, special, be it special service, army, or be it uh, militaries together. It's in uh, Slavic languages, Russian, Ukrainian, the general term Sila Viki. And then also uh, less influenced by so-called nationalistic elements. The next point, in 2020, and it was a DM, I don't know from whom, um, uh, there will be election in US, and the new president named Eric Garcetti will be elected as US president from Democratic Party. And from this point, so it's trajectory, but let's, let's, let's wait and see. And new constructive US policy towards Ukraine uh, will be started, because it's my personal perception, current US policy to Ukraine, to some extent, is quite ambiguous. Uh, or even sometimes definitely pushing current Ukraine political mainstream to further escalation due to different reasons, but nevertheless. And I suppose it's not too good in this case. Then in 2021, there will be a start of DPR-LPR integration to Ukraine with some figures from these rebel republics left for some period of time in governing until mid of 2020s. So in the center of this, it will be issues of amnesty, issues of collaboration, or respective some steps, or even laws adopted uh, specializing this. And you can see, for example, exactly last week, there was quite a large forum in Ukraine where current minister uh, of interior, Avakov, who is quite an influential figure, who spoke exactly and uh, he presented his proposals on the way how to uh, firstly deoccupy and then reintegrate Donbass, and special emphasis by him was put exactly on this element about amnesty and collaboration. He proposed just to, to draft a loss, to adopt a loss uh, in order to get this through. The next element is about economy. Marshall Plan 2 will be uh, firstly uh, proposed and then adopted for Ukraine, and then it will be as some kind of effect growth at FDI aimed to key industries uh, in Ukraine and infrastructure development, be it software, airplane, space industry, and it will be mostly concentrated around Kharkiv, Kyiv, and Dnipro. Plus, some FDIs will come as well to traditional uh, sectors such uh, like as agriculture, machinery, or metallurgy. Uh, due to the whole development implementing DCFTA, its deep comprehensive free trade agreement with European Union, there will be much more easy access to EU markets. And low costs in Ukraine uh, will make this region, which I mentioned, quite attractive for investing, bo boosting the whole economic development. Then, if uh, we're talking about the problem of corruption, which is much more talked not only in Ukraine, but also outside, uh, it will remain, but more or less accepted as a part of doing profitable business, although civil society keeps corruption from spearing out of control. So the emphasis will be on anti-corruption authorities, which will be quite effective. And for example, last uh, week on, uh, I suppose it was on the 7th of June, the law quite fiercely uh, discussed and uh, debated in Ukraine since two years, the law on anti-corruption court has been finally adopted in Rada, and so let's see how far it will go. And then the last point, it's about actually um, civil society, namely with some conjunction with church. So civil society and church, we foresee they will join uh, efforts in building up cross-regional networks and making society in general more tolerant. And as well, they will be, if needed, quite successful in countering so-called nationalistic groups in society or nationalistic moods, or which somehow, in some cases, are being promoted in the last two or three years. So it was scenario number one. All right. Uh, thank you, Alexei. Uh, I think um, I will ask uh, presenters of the scenarios to be as brief as possible and perhaps um, limit a little bit the um, discussion of the situation today to just what's absolutely necessary. Um, so, Alexander Shelley, please, what's scenario number two? I try to be more short, but first of all, I express my gratitude, very deep gratitude to the Center for Strategic and International Studies for a long and strong support of Ukrainian independence and territorial integrity for the last 27 years, I visited your center, not it's my first visit. I delivered a lot of my presentation here for a long period of time, and I know that you very strongly support my country. Thanks. And a lot of thanks, all of you who are here. For me, it's more surprise because I because in Kiev now a lot of rumors that Ukraine is not very popular as a topic in Washington, but whole is occupied totally. Young people, 
professional, so thank all of you that you are with us. A few words why I agreed to participate in this exercise. You know that Ukrainian crisis provoked by Russia aggression <laughs> lead to very deep crisis of international European security system. And uh, now it's obvious that without settlement of Ukrainian crisis, it will be impossible to, to find a new solution for international security and especially for European security system. It's obvious. And the Minsk uh, process or Minsk's uh, decision, it's about ceasefire, but not about strategic settlement of Ukrainian crisis. And as I think uh, now it's obvious, we need some grand strategy for decision Ukrainian crisis and along with it uh, the crisis of international and European security system. And I agree to participate in this exercise of developing fourth scenario as some kind of provocation for, for all of us uh, to try to imagine uh, what will be Ukraine 2027, and if Ukraine will be in one of these fourth scenario, maybe we provoke intellectual, deep intellectual discussion among all of you. Somebody agree with this scenario, somebody will be may, may be strongly against, and uh, maybe develop their own vision for the future of Ukraine, and it helps not only Ukraine, but it helps the to transform the national system from uncertainty to more predictability and to more secure status. It's the first. Second, it's very, very important. You can see that we took two, two elements to develop this is fourth scenario. State capacity and social cohesion, inside social cohesion. No, not international elements. In Ukraine, we were, we were very strongly criticized on it because now people and a lot of intellectuals inside of my country try to treat situation as the struggle between West and East, uh, between um, Russia and United States and Western countries. And may, a lot of, of them told us, pointed out to us, why you speak only about internal elements to, de to de develop future scenarios. But our team very strongly believe that Ukraine never transfer as a successful country if we refocusing um, our view that we, now we try to explain why we in this situation because because Russia is strong or Russia wrong, because West not strongly support us, not enough support us. So we try to decide our problems with uh, some interpretation, some events outside of us. But we strongly believe that only if Ukraine concentrate on homework, it's our own exercise. And if Ukraine, through such vision, such, such approach, recognize that what happens with my country exists some guilty of our elite, of our society, civil society, and only if we change statehood, if we change Ukrainian civil society, it will be possible to overcome this is crisis inside of Ukraine and out of Ukraine. It's my general remarks. Scenario number two, the most successful scenario. High state capacity, high social cohesion, permit state and social society be so strong that not too afraid to start broad reconciliation process inside of Ukraine. Through uh, finding compromises, through a starting mechanism of inclusivity in all sphere of social and statehood life. So it's permit, it's only as to me one possible instrument to reintegrate country in the borders of 1991. Because it's very easy to finalize this crisis uh, with division of Ukraine for, for some parts 
if we try to 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 reintegrate my country with some antagonistic ideas and uh, ideology, but what we need to to restore Ukraine a successful country is to reconcile country inside. So, it according to this scenario, a new president, which will be elected in next year. Uh, it will be Yaroslav Mudry in translation in, in translation in English Yaroslav Wise. So our scenario demand not force. Our scenario demand wisdom, common sense. <laughs> yes, and if uh, I, I, we think it will be a strong president, but a very a president with a great vision or great uh, wisdom, which push this is reconciliation process together with the strong civil society, and it's permit to start political reconciliation process inside of Ukraine, new quality dialogue between eastern part of Ukraine and Ukraine, and between Crimea and Ukraine, we are not exclude Crimea in this scenario, and uh, it's will provoke the more wicked development of economic growth. And it's very, very important that if Ukrainian leadership start reconciliation inside of Ukraine, we are sure it's permit international system, international community, also to start reconciliation process over the Ukraine. Because one of the reasons of Ukrainian crisis is a struggle between Russia and uh, West for Ukraine. This scenario a very clear message to West and Russia. Our Ukrainian state and our Ukrainian civil society are so strong that we are ready to take responsibility for our future in our own hands. And this reconciliation, please, now we send message to West and Russia, continue struggle for Ukraine. But in this scenario, we send another message. Please conclude sustainable, peaceful settlement over the Ukraine. To finalize, this is second edition of the Cold War over the Ukraine. And uh, I put a point here because I think I provoke uh, some questions and I prefer to answer the question. And the substance of scenario you can see in the book that you received before the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, and now on to uh, scenario number three, uh, Sam Chirp. I think we're starting to get into the gloomier scenarios, right? <laughs> That's right. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, and um, I should just mention that uh, although I was uh, not an author of, of this scenario, um, we're, as presenters here, not making normative presentation, presentations. These aren't our preferred scenarios as our personal preferences, but merely the ones that we have been assigned in the context of this scenario exercise to write and present. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, so whereas the, the first scenario you heard, um, the, uh, the activist was low state capacity and high social cohesion. And what Alexandra just laid out was the ascendant scenario that is high state capacity and high social cohesion. I will be presenting very briefly the um, adversary scenario, which is low state capacity and low social cohesion. So this is not going to be a fun one. Um, uh, by 2027, uh, just working back from uh, where the scenario ends up, there has been a, um, a uh, nationalistic military coup, which has seized power in Ukraine. Uh, the country's identity is uh, cemented internationally as a frontier battleground between East and West. Uh, the economy has not improved, um, corruption may, remains endemic, and Ukrainians continue to uh, leave the country uh, in uh, significant numbers. Um, so, uh, and also, that, as uh, noted on the slide here, we've, um, we have the continuation of the conflict uh, in, in the Donbass. Um, so how did we get from here to there? Uh, in this scenario, President Poroshenko is re-elected in 2019 uh, and continues uh, or perhaps uh, turns more towards a process of consolidating power. Uh, efforts uh, that had been undertaken towards modernization and reform are, are sidelined in favor of measures to, uh, to keep those in power in power. Um, and we end up with a situation where the rule of law, particularly uh, in, at the uh, regional level, 
uh, is continuing to weaken and control over um, the, the Donbass is, um, remains uh, beyond uh, uh, the central government. Uh, in many of the regions, uh, the government came to rely on um, uh, volunteer battalions to enforce the law, uh, ceding the uh, monopoly on the use of force uh, in an effort to maintain control. Uh, people to people connections across the uh, uh, line of contact in the Donbass and uh, the uh, Isthmus in, in Crimea have been largely cut off. Um, poverty has deepened, the gap between rich and, rich and poor has deepened. Uh, and the continuing dominance of patron-client relations in Ukrainian politics ensures that oligarchs uh, remain firmly control in most of Ukraine's economic sectors. So as a result of all this uh, great news, um, there, uh, there comes a time towards 2024 when uh, President Poroshenko is in fact ousted by a military coup um, with the support of the uh, majority of the population and a right-wing authoritarian regime takes power with a general as head of state uh, and suspends elections indefinitely. Uh, Ukraine is sort of the cornerstone of uh, a uh, frontline battleground in, in the broader uh, uh, Cold War between um, uh, the West and Russia. Uh, Russia is the sort of cornerstone of, in turn of all of U Ukraine's internal discussions about domestic and foreign policy. Um, and the military remains the one institution in the country where uh, that people uh, have, the Ukrainian people have confidence in. Um, so uh, that is the adversary scenario. Okay, so that's, that's cheerful and aptly uh, illustrated here on the slide. Um, so Reinhardt, you're gonna cheer us up with a slightly less gloomy one, right? Sure, um, I just wanna point out again Scenarios is not something we looked in a crystal bowl and think this will happen. These scenarios could happen, and all the people who took part in this intellectual endeavor agreed this could happen. If one would have said scenario X, Y is impossible, then we couldn't have done it. So all of us agreed they are in general possible. It's not saying this is how it will be. Um, the administrator, high state capacity and low so social cohesion, uh, we understood there will be, uh, after the next elections, um, a technocratic leadership, um, which except for the moment the loss or the annexation of Crimea for the time being, same goes for the control of Donbass, but only for the time being. So this technocratic um, administration in Ukraine is going for a top-down modernization process as much as it is possible, um, guided by the DCFTA, the Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Agreement with the uh, European Union, um, but also trying to work out some kind of um, cooperation with the Eurasian Economic um, Union. Uh, modernization goes towards um, the sphere of agriculture and industry. Um, since this is a very high state capacity, um, society is not being an important part in this scenario. Um, the society is disillusioned, um, longing for some sort um, of stability, um, being kind of um, apathetic towards corruption, which, which we still have. Um, and they're looking towards fighting corruption on the long term. Um, the younger generation um, is kind of pragmatic or apathetic, one of those two, um, understanding that for the moment um, the huge um, challenge of um, Crimea and the Donbass uh, will be dealt with in the long term process. Um, other countries um, look at Ukraine with a certain fatigue. Um, for the US, um, it has no strategic interest according to the scenario, um, and Russia um, is not interested in this scenario for more escalation, um, is supporting a peacekeeping mission. In this scenario, we're saying according to the contact line. Um, so it is a scenario 
which in the former countries of the Soviet Union uh, we have seen in transition, and um, that's why we called it the administrator. Um, it is something which um, is very much state orientated, and the role of civil society or society in general is fairly low. Thank you. So, Julia, you've had the opportunity to go through some of these and think about them. Uh, what's your take uh, on what we've heard today, and uh, what uh, what we can what you know we have available to us to read? Yeah. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me here today. Uh, I think it's particularly appropriate uh, that we're having this discussion uh, today, as the Normandy format uh, group has uh, been. Uh, they decided to kind of re-engage, so they're meeting today. Uh, in Berlin to talk in, about in this moment yes right at right at this moment uh, to talk about how to revive talks and in particular you know what role peacekeepers can play uh, in the Donbass um, so uh, it's particularly appropriate uh, for us to kind of dive in and explore all of this um, before I go any further I do want to make a little bit of a disclaimer I'm a visiting scholar uh, at the Carnegie Endowment but I am a US government employee I'm there on sabbatical so all of my comments are my own personal views. Um, I, I really commend this effort. I think uh, scenarios are a great way to understand uncertainties, and it's actually an approach that uh, I don't see uh, being done all of all that often in such a rigorous manner. So I, I enjoyed kind of marching through each of the scenarios, and um, I, I did notice that you know the the key drivers are both internal uh, drivers to Ukraine, and you know thank you for your comments on that. I, I understand uh, very much um, the desire I for that. It. Yeah, yeah, and, and it makes sense. I would say that uh, a nice kind of companion exercise would be to take two external drivers. Uh, that, that actually could uh, provide a whole other uh, set of kind of illustrative uh, experiences, something like uh, looking at the EU divided and cohesive versus uh, maybe Russian threat perceptions, you know, low or high. Uh, so that would be a nice um, companion piece if you're looking for another project uh, down the road. Um, I'll, I'll make a couple of comments about each uh, scenario. I know that um, you know, all, all of them are relatively plausible, and um, you know, whenever you engage in this, the instruction is to, to, to not fight the scenario. But ever since you asked me to comment, um, I'll, I'll, just, I'll fight just a little bit, because maybe some of my reactions mirror um, some of yours in the audience. Um, I, I would say first, I noticed uh, across the board, across all the scenarios, I was a little bit surprised at uh, the, the way that Russia, the role of Russia was treated um, in nearly all of them, except I think the, the third, the adversary scenario, uh, you know, Russia is basically um, kind of a, a benevolent actor. They, they are um, coming to terms with the need to uh, resolve uh, the, the conflict and or they're uh, comforted by a, a divided Europe and the threat perceptions have gone down. So that, that's, that's just, that was just an interesting observation uh, that I had. I wonder if, uh, if that element of all of this is, is, um, is really accurate. Uh, and then I also noticed across the board, um, the population of the Donbass is largely treated as a, like a, a reactive component. Uh, so they're, they're reacting to um, you know, whether Ukraine is um, successful in integrating them or not, or the degree to which you know, Russia is continuing to support them. That, of course, um, this population was very much subject to um, the efforts of uh, external actors in the beginning of the conflict. But I would, I would posit that perhaps by 2027, you know, the longer that uh, conflict goes on and, and the, the more um, kind of cohesive a, a given region becomes, the greater uh, the likelihood that this region becomes or, or wants to express its own voice and, and has its own views uh, and its own stake and say in the matter. So uh, I push back a little bit uh, on that part of the, the scenarios as well. Um, 
But what I thought was really most useful through this exercise was the ability to kind of pick out the, the key factors and strands that, that then will bear watching uh, as, you know, as we uh, see the future for Ukraine unfolding before us. And I, I saw that in the first scenario, the activist scenario, really the, the, the pivot point there was decentralization and the success of that effort. Uh, and that, um, that really uh, stuck out to me. Um, similarly, in the, the second scenario, the ascendant, uh, it's really hinged on leadership and the, um, the extent to which uh, a, a new kind of more, um, uh, more, more benevolent and wise uh, leader uh, can come to the fore. I mean, this scenario I did feel was perhaps too good to be true. Uh, I wasn't sure that that uh, you know such a political leader really exists uh, in today's world. Uh, although maybe that's just um, a resident of Washington D.C. talking. Um, but at the, at the same time. Um, you know, I also wondered in this, in the ascendant scenario, as well as um, the administrator scenario, you know, there are these promises of, of non-alignment for Ukraine. So close relationship with Europe, but non-alignment. And I wondered if, um, you know, if that would be seen by a, a Ukrainian leader as in Ukraine's best interest. Uh, and then also if the if these pledges of non-alignment would truly be believed and accepted by Moscow. Uh, so I, I wondered about that. Uh, the adversary scenario uh, really uh, rings true. Uh, I mean, this, this is kind of the Ukraine back to the future that uh, I think a lot of us uh, fear in, in terms of backsliding uh, on reform, the, the rise of corruption. And, um, and you know, Ukraine kind of stuck as that battleground between East and West. So uh, that, that certainly uh, has a, an element of, um, of you know, big, begrudging uh, fear to it. Um, just to wrap up, I would say that uh, I, kind of going forward, the, the best use of this exercise would be to really kind of clearly lay out uh, the signposts and indicators uh, from the scenarios that can help guide us to help us see, you know, where what direction things are going over the next few years. And uh, you know, I think that uh, you could parse it out uh, quite specifically. You know, there, there. I looked at really three um, broad sets of indicators. Uh, sorry, five broad sets of indicators: three internal to Ukraine and two external. Um, and so the three internal are, you know, largely align with the, the two by two um, key drivers. The first would be looking at the, the governance structure of Ukraine. So, you know, are they going to move to a, a kind of president parliamentary uh, split system or more of a parliamentary based system? But that seemed to be very key. And again, uh, linked to the second one, which is uh, the decentralization and work against corruption. Uh, so the, the signing of the new, uh, the new law just today, correct? I think Poroshenko signed. You know, that, that kind of fit in that basket of where are we on the anti-corruption uh, reform campaign. Um, and then the final uh, indicator on the internal side, of course, would be the health of Ukrainian civil society. Uh, so, you know, what's, what's the status there? How, what, are, what would be good ways to measure this? Um, that, that is something that I started to think about. And I also wonder to what extent, uh, as, as we move into the next few years uh, in the run-up, maybe to next year's election, uh, to what extent uh, will some of these robust elements of Ukrainian civil society uh, be able to move into, uh, into governance? Uh, I mean, that's, that's actually, I think, uh, going to be a, a kind of a, a critical moment for Ukraine as well. Uh, it's wonderful to have civil society kind of on the outside of government as a watchdog, um, but it's also uh, very useful if there can be, you know, kind of a revolving door and those uh, parts of society uh, come in and have a say within government as well. Uh, and then finally, the, uh, the two kind of external indicators are the ones I already mentioned um, for your next project, uh, and that is looking at Europe 
and the ex not so much the extent to which it is engaged with Ukraine, but I think uh, the extent to which it's uh, divided or or cohesive in in, in and of itself. Uh, and then the final one would be looking at. Um, you know, Russian threat perceptions, its, it's view of Ukraine as uh, key to its own security uh, and um, its view of uh, not only with regard to kind of the former Soviet space, but um, the, the view that Russia may hold uh, of a kind of a successful uh, Western integrated Ukraine and the threat that that might pose to kind of Russia's own trajectory. So thank you very much. Thanks, Julia. And I think that that was actually a really nice uh, framework through which to look at these. Um, I want to give our uh, presenters a chance to respond to Julia. Before I do, I'm going to throw one more question in for them to respond to just kind of to keep it um, uh, to, to consent to the question, which is that none of these scenarios actually offer a prospect of EU or NATO membership. Um, that, is that because you think it's, you know, it, did you expect that to be an outcome as you were developing the scenarios? Was it a bounding um, issue? And what, what should we take from that? So um, I don't know in what order. And, um, we, can, yeah, we can go in reverse order. Sure. Uh, oh, reverse order of rank card. <laughs> First of all, <clears throat> uh, I agree with you that we put forward all the fourth scenario with some our classification, and it's provoked to develop another one, and maybe with another uh, principles of their construction and development. I comment on my side only one question, possibility of membership in NATO and EU. In my activity, for more than 20 years in Ukrainian diplomacy on the leadership position, and in my involvement in the crucial negotiation process concerning the EU, Ukraine relations and EU NATO relations, uh, I pr was present in the most crucial moments, 2004 when was a big enlargement of EU, 2008 during the Bucharest summit, uh, concerning the uh, MAP membership action plan for Ukraine, which administration of Bush tried to to promote for Ukraine, but it was blocked by Germany and France. In 2004, after the big enlargement of EU, I left Ministry of Foreign Affairs in my capacity as the first Deputy Minister, State Secretary for European Integration, with declaration in new approach. It was clear for me in 2004 that Ukraine have no chance to be a member of EU, not because of Ukraine, because of EU. And the same for NATO, not because of Ukraine, because of NATO. And it's a very deep geopolitical and geoeconomic roots in such position of Western <coughs> bloc. So I think your position that the door is open is a little not moral. In reality, the door is closed. So you promo provoke, in some sense, a Ukrainian society, Ukrainian political forces. So, but I am 100% for continuation of Euro-Atlantic integration and continuation of European integration. But I do differences between membership and integration as such. And there are a lot of countries in Europe which are neither member of EU, neither member of NATO, but very deeply integrated in security NATO structures or in European EU structures. So from this point of view, from this point of view, as a specialist who negotiate, who very well know what, what is doing in Washington, in Brussels, Ukraine have no one chance, as to me, to be member in 2027, neither in the United NATO. So, so to my mind, the policy which tried to to change this is objective reality. It's very counterproductive and very dangerous for my country, because if you follow illusions, 
you will not reach secure status. It's my very clear answer, and I dream to meet you in 2027, and I'm sure Ukraine in 2027 will be neither EU member, neither NATO member. The question, the key question for all of us, to find such security and geoeconomic status of Ukraine between West and Russia, which will be recognizable from the both sides, from the Russia side and West, and will be accepted inside of Ukraine. It's a strategic task, it's a dream. I agree that scenario number two, the, more, the best, but the, maybe looks like a dream. But your great president, Mr. Kennedy, told sometimes it's necessary to have a dream. Yeah, if I can jump in there. CNN covered the first of those variables. The second variable, the Russian variable, and the threat perception there, this was a key point of our discussion. So this got pretty tense during uh, our dialogue, both as a group and I believe in a couple of the smaller groups who were fleshing out the scenarios as well. And if I recall correctly, what we determined was this is a huge effect on all of the scenarios. However, it is more certain than state cohesion in Ukraine, whether that would be strong or weak, that there was really one position that our group came to on uh, whether Russian threat perceptions would change over 10 years or not. And I think we determined that in general they would stay relatively the same. Therefore, uh, high effect, but more certain. Therefore, not one of our two key drivers. But it perhaps should be a part of more of these scenarios. And Reiner, can I have you go back to the two by two really quickly, which gets us to my, to my second point here more generally, which is <clears throat> what we have here in our exercise is each of these scenarios that we have here fleshed out is just a single point inside each of the four quadrants with different participants on a different day in a different meeting in a different city, we would come up with entirely different scenarios for each of these four quadrants. It's an endless number of possible futures even within each of these four quadrants. So absolutely, we could do this again and should do it again, either with the same group of people with different drivers, the key to your drivers, or again with different groups of people or <coughs> different drivers altogether. Different people, you end up with perhaps something in the same scenario, a little bit closer to the center, a little bit farther to a corner, somewhere else in each of those boxes. Part of the benefit of doing this in a systematic way is that you can run it over and over again with different groups of people and come up with nuances or new insights each and every time. So thank you very much for the comments. Do other folks want to weigh in on any of the, uh, Reinhardt I think is first, yeah. Yeah, just a small remark. Um, in all the cities we have presented the scenario so far, there was always a discussion on Russia in the EU and sometimes the United States, clearly. Um, and most of all in Kiev. But interesting enough, after we, we had a discussion for three hours. Don't worry, we don't do this today. <laughs> um, and after an hour, um, people from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Ukraine were kind of saying, this is interesting for us that you only concentrated on domestic issues and then they're responding to that. Um, and we heard this in other cities too, that this is something which these scenarios do, which usually they don't, because you have Russia and the EU and, and other big players. Um, so this was something new, um, and it took a while to get accustomed to that, um, because it's easy to say, well, we can do whatever we want, but it all depends on Russia. Um, so the discussion we had then in Kiev was quite interesting on that issue, um, uh, that people from the um, planning division of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Kiev were kind of open and said, okay, let's look into that and actually this is something challenging for us more to look into that. That was interesting, I thought, um, from um, a country from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Kiev who could easily say, you know, we're looking basically at Russia and the rest is important, but, you know, how can we develop without that? Thank you. I will also comment something on this NATO EU perspectives. Uh, first of all, if you take just even what we had in 2016 already, some normative basis to say that actually there were very few chances, be it EU or NATO membership, 
On NATO membership, we have quite some criteria, uh, which were the case for all previous members to be accepted in the NATO, which uh, for which for Ukraine there is a problem. First of all, agreement from all of the sides. We can talk, for example, be it let's be open, be it France, be it Germany, or some other NATO members who are not in favor of this. They were not in favor in 2008 when the situation was much more favorable than today. Factor number two. If we take our bilateral relations with the United States, even by Obama administration and by current administration, on official and official level, our uh, guys, official I mean, they tried to get, first of all, not so NATO membership action plan, but even, for example, uh, so-called status of most preferred uh, partner for Ukraine, and they did not. What does it mean? It actually, for the perspective, is not very good. If coming to the EU, there is very unique and even now normative stop for these talks, which was not the case for all previous countries and even for Ukraine, where to some extent the EU officials could tell us the door is open. Now the door is closed, according to EU Council decision in December, December 2016. Read this. December 2016, EU Council decision as a follow-up of a referendum in Netherlands and as a pretext for elections parliamentary in Netherlands, where there are five points, one of which is actually association agreement with Ukraine is not about membership, full stop. To adopt this, you, you can imagine, EU Council decision, all the members who agreed with this, afterwards to revert this position is very hard. So the discussion for us as being profits in this sphere, we should understand that some decisions are quite difficult then to change in five years, or especially for eight years. And then talking on EU, which for me it was the theme of uh, my doctoral thesis on Germany, apropos, but on eastwards integration. Uh, mostly we're talking about the criteria which refer to the applicants. Uh, mostly these are so-called Copenhagen criteria, and there are three. But actually, if you take the legal side, there is a fourth criteria, not mentioned at all. And the fourth criteria, it's about ability of the European Union to take concrete member state. If we take even two sides, okay, with Ukraine we can even tackle the progress in economy, social development, and some uh, all this so-called uh, legal agenda. But at the end of the day, we will confront with the fourth criteria: ability of the European Union to take Ukraine today, almost zero. Whether it will be ability of European Union to take Ukraine in five years, uh, if we take the development of European Union nowadays? Question mark. Huge question mark. And to be realistic, because if you are not realistic, you are going into the trap to spend your resources for some kind of dreams, which at the end of the time will not be realized, and you will be in a situation, spend a lot of resources, getting nothing, and then claiming all around that they are to be blamed because I am unsuccessful. Responsible approach would be to tackle reality as it is. Trying to improve it, but to tackle reality as it is. And we try it by this scenario. It's not a forecast. It's scenario. Main ways according to which Ukraine can develop and the unique which Reinhardt told, it's exactly to focus more on domestic development. Not disregarding, first of all, Russia and all aggressive sides, of course. But first of all, to tackle domestic development because me as Ukrainian, it's not unique, I'm more than convinced much depends on ourselves. If we would like to improve our country, to defend our country, it's our business. First of all, of course, not, an, not disregarding all external factors, but first of all, it's about us. And then if we take this approach, maybe we'll be much more successful. Can I add something? Okay. Look, I want to continue this. Is, we are the part, Ukraine, it's, you have to understand us. In, in former time, we were part of empire, part of the great state. In my heart, a small piece of the former Soviet Union. In reality, so yes, sorry. yes, yes, uh, yes, because we were born there. It's mentality. But now Ukraine not a great state. And we have no ability to change Russia or to change United States or to change EU. So we try in our presentation to show that what we really influence to change situation inside of my country, to create more stronger civil society, to build more stronger state, and from this to influence on our future. 
And my second remark, I personally 100% sure that membership of Ukraine in NATO is the best security solution for Ukraine. That membership of Ukraine in EU is the best solution for economic growth and prosperity of my country. But 100% as a specialist and professional, I am sure that next 10 years it's impossible. So I want to focus on realities and to focus because many Ukrainian practitioners now who negotiate with them practical points try to speak only to persuade West and EU to change position and to promise to us membership in NATO in real terms, in MAP or in uh, candidate status. I prefer to concentrate how to implement deeper, comprehensive and deep association agreements how to implement deeper existing Ukraine-NATO programs. To be more practical, not to try to reach what's impossible, but to do what's real possible. Because unfortunately, we have a lack of capacities. And if we spend a lot of capacities to reach non-realistic ideas, it's better to concentrate this as capacity to implement what really possible to implement and to increase our capabilities with our cooperation with West. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to turn uh, the floor over to the audience here. I'm going to take uh, three questions at a time, and um, let's start here in the front. Thank you. Yulia Nikitina, Gimo University, Moscow. Um, well, actually, I can say that uh, Russia has lived uh, through all those four scenarios. Uh, starting with the uh, ascendant uh, Gorbachev, Yaroslav Mudry, uh, then adversary GKCP failed coup d'etat, uh, then activist early Yeltsin's uh, era, and administrator Medvedev, probably. <laughs> uh, so I, I can't say that all of those scenarios were, uh, well, the results were really successful. So what are the uh, lessons that you can draw from Russian experience uh, for the Ukrainian case, because you have this example. And in your four uh, scenarios um, said uh, you, you don't have any similar to the Putin scenario in Russia, so what would be the suggestions for such a parallel? And is there any place for democracy in your uh, methodology, because you took uh, civil society participation, but not democracy? So why is it explicitly excluded from the list? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and yeah, please do identify yourself and please do ask a question. Let's just go straight back. Uh, Patrick Savage, a uh, recent graduate from the Georgetown Security Studies Program. Um, obviously, in the, uh, the aggressor uh, or the adversary uh, scenario, the, the military played a, a pretty large or predominant role. I was wondering if in these discussions in the research you've done, what sort of role, if any, and, or how important was the military came up in any of these other scenarios, whether it's maybe taking part or being affected by decentralization or, or even just sort of providing a secure environment for some of these prospective reforms to occur? Question, and uh, bring it back to Wayne. Uh, Wayne Mary, the American Foreign Policy Council. I noticed that none of the four scenarios posits what I might characterize as a third Maidan. And that's curious because recent history has seen two occasions in which the Ukrainian street became very activist. And if you look at the demographics of Ukraine, particularly of its younger population, I would have thought the potential for a third Maidan actually might have been a realistic component of all four scenarios, but certainly of several of them. And I'm kind of wondering why not. I might also just note that the visual presentations of the four scenarios, the two positive ones are both feminine, the two negative ones are both masculine. The two positive ones are both uh, high social cohesion. So it suggests that high social cohesion gets you primary colors and uh, more female gendered results. <laughs> right. Let's, uh, <laughs> Sam, do you want to take any of these things? Do I? I, I don't know, but uh, you didn't answer the uh, original set of questions, okay. so. I guess I'll just, uh, on the question of democracy, um, the definition of state capacity, of course, uh, is slightly varies from uh, scenario to scenario. Um, while uh, the democratic quality of the um, of the Ukraine that we see in all of these uh, does vary accordingly, 
uh, I think our authors came to different conclusions about what high state capacity means um, for democracy in, in the various cases, and that's kind of an interesting point here. In the cases where there's both, I mean, in the case where there's both high state capacity and uh, high uh, social cohesion, you do have a democratic outcome. Uh, I think that is not true when you have high state capacity and low social cohesion, uh, which gets me to the, the Putin parallel. Uh, if, I, I mean, I would imagine that the administrator one looks more like uh, maybe early Putin <laughs> than, uh, than, uh, than any of the others. But um, uh, on this question of a third Maidan, I, I think, you know, in the, the challenge of um, drawing up the narratives, uh, we did not start from what we see today. We started from a world in 2027 and tried to walk back from it. And perhaps interestingly, in none of, uh, in none of those uh, exercises about building a narrative back from an imagined future, did uh, any of the authors uh, find a place for a third Maidan, uh, per se? Uh, in the case where there is a more um, prominent role for society and a lesser of one for the state, um, which is the, uh, the first, um, that manifests itself in terms of uh, decentralization and more uh, um, social involvement uh, on the regional level. Alexei, you wanted to jump in as well? And but first, uh, I would like a uh, quite uh, short comment on what Yulia said. For me, it was interesting just uh, to have in comparison between Russia and Ukraine. In this case, Russia had these four scenarios. What about Ukraine? I suppose the difference is in this scenario where we just um, compare both countries, especially now, but even before. From my perspective as Ukrainian, the major difference, uh, a part of many other differences between Russia and Ukraine, Russian political system and maybe in general system are built on so-called vertical approach. You need some one person at the top and then the whole line going up to the knees. Then the question to, to what extent this system is uh, capable to tackle both with internal and domestic uh, threats or some kind of challenges. Sometimes yes, if we're talking about quite a huge country with very complex issues, sometimes no, because you have a problem with many challenges to tackle immediately by one person and so we have. And the um, specificity of Ukraine, it is what's exactly what didn't understand and still don't understand many Russian officials. Uh, to some extent, it was a very uh, happy case for us Ukrainians in 2014, because that was a huge mistake by them, why we didn't fail. Our system is built, and it's not the case now, even since 1991, on horizontal approach. Horizontal approach means you have many centers of power. You have many actors, real uh, influential actors. So to tackle or to destroy the whole system, you should address many immediately, which is theoretically very expensive endeavor. And therefore, uh, it's just another system on the positive way in this case, but on the negative case in other, when you need just to concentrate all your powers, all your efforts on one aim, and then you have a problem to agree with all these guys, all these groups, to concentrate on one thing. And this is, um, if you backtrack the whole Ukrainian history, and especially modern history since 1991, you will see exactly this problem in Ukraine. And then the question of Sot Maidan. Uh, actually, first of all, just theoretically, for these events to happen, you need some time to be prepared for this. Especially, you need some resources beat people together such amount of people and then uh, literally resources because my dance if you just be very careful it's okay thousands of people or hundred thousands gathering but if you gather the people not for one week or even two weeks and three you need literally some resources support it's it's not uh, a very easy task and then you need uh, the people a uh, very clear message uh, which they would like uh, to stand for or would like to stand against. And nowadays, uh, you have quite a huge disillusionment in Ukrainian society about actually the results. Okay, we have done almost anything possible with people to convince their, at the top, to change their behavior. And if we are not successful, w w what can else? What can else could be done? And then this disillusionment is very high in Ukraine, so I don't see perspective for Sot Maidan. And you see quite a huge and very negative indicator in the last two years in Ukraine when the people started to vote on their food. If you take the numbers of the people emigrated from Ukraine, especially young people, quite well educated, 
the numbers are huge. Hundreds of thousands for the last two years emigrated from the country. Maybe they will come back, hopefully. Maybe some of them will not. And if these active people or disappointed people or the people who don't see themselves in Ukraine are emigrating, you, you are having uh, out the resource of this be it appraisal or resource of some kind opposite uh, forces which should be in place. And then you will have no third Maidan because no quite large forces are inside the country. Most of them may be outside the country. So this is an answer. Yeah, I think um, what uh, Yulia Nikitina said, um, looking at the scenarios and then looking at Russia's development for the last 25, 30 years, for me at least, that was definitely something I was thinking about. And um, I agree with uh, Sam when he said the uh, administrator could be something where society looks at stability for the moment, even though um, a couple of years ago that was exactly not what was seen, not a stability at any price. Um, but the administrator is kind of a possible answer to what also society sees as instability, and at least for the common couple of years, which we were envisioned 2027, um, the society is looking more for stability than for a possible third Maidan. Um, the illustrations you put out, you are not the first one who is asking that. Um, if we had done this differently, the same question would have come. So we thought, why not doing this, the positive scenarios, um, with three en two energetic people from the civil society um, and the other one with men. But uh, you can exchange that, of course. Uh, we are, to illustrate them, um, we wanted to make sure that we have this discussion. You don't forget the scenarios. OK. Um, so Gregory and then. Just very quickly, on the military question, it did come up in discussions. It may not have made its way into each of the scenarios as much as it did in a, in a single scenario. And, and Wayne, to your point, again, with the third Maidan, um, uh, again, I think the issue was raised. Had you been there, we could have sent you around to each of the groups and made sure that it made its way in. Again, so much of what we see here is just an artifact of where we are on that particular day with the people in the room, a slightly different uh, number of people or arrangement of people, and we would end up, again, perhaps with these four quadrants, but with very different looking scenarios. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Let's, let's get another round of questions in. Okay, um, over here. Um, uh, please wait for the microphone. Please wait for the microphone. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, Lubo Ostrovsk, and here represent the Federal Cultural F Foundation, though I have other, I'm president of biotech company too. So I have colleagues in Ukraine, and originally I'm from Ukraine. I m moved to the United States 20 years ago, but I travel back and forth very often. And I can watch the processes, not from the computer screen, and not from the office, I can watch the real life. So what I would like to say, is that exercising developing scenarios for Ukraine, I would rather concentrate on developing of scenarios for the whole civilized world. Do you, do you world. have a question? Yes, I have a question, and I have comment first. But uh, actually, uh, could you ask a question? question? We have is, very limited uh, time. So what is the scenario for the whole civilized world regarding the situation when the country who spends 57 percentage GDP to, for the military operation has to do and build society and develop society. So what is your vision? Just imagine, just imagine the situation when Europe and US spend more than 50 percentage of GDP for the military operations. So how the I don't think any country, can I don't think, I, I, Ukraine does not spend more than 50 percent of its GDP. I agree. It spends so five. I, yeah. I, I, I give you an easy task. Easy task. So the, the question is, the um, one country tries uh, to develop I, the values I, of I, civilized society, of okay. American Great. values, and European values. I, so think, we, I think, we, I think okay. we've understood That's your question. question. So if you could give up yes. your microphone, thank we'll you so get much. another question. Thank you, and All thank right. you very much for not interrupting me. Thank you. OK, uh, over here. <laughs> oh, here you are. Sorry. <laughs> good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, may I ask you a question? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I'm Mikola Vorobyov. I'm a Ukrainian journalist. Currently, I'm a research scholar at SAIS. So I would just to jump in with some uh, even more realities and facts. 
uh, regarding the future scenarios. First of all, thanks very much for your presentation, which was very informative for my further, further research. But according to the recent polls in terms of the next presidential elections, so we can see that, uh, which was taken by Kyiv International Institute of Sociology, which is quite credible organization in Ukraine. So it's say that uh, if elections would happen like in the nearest future, Yulia Tymoshenko would have 24.6, populist leader Oleg Leshko of Radical Party 15.5, then Minister of Defense, Foreign Minister of Defense, Anatoly Hrysenko 12.5, and Poroshenko, current president, has only 9.8%. So basically I think that uh, the question is the following. The al another alarming thing is that pro-Russian candidates, Boyka and Rabinovich, get the same as current president. So Rabinovich would get 9.5 percent, Boyka 9.7 Mikhail, can you ask a question? The question is, didn't you consider uh, in your future scenarios the creeping revenge of the pro-Russian forces in Ukraine, which already happened in 2010 when Yushchenko lost of the or or Orange Revolution with 5.5 percent of support? Don't you consider the creeping revenge of the pro-Russian forces? Thank you. Let's take one more question and just uh, pass it. Um, Stanley Kober. Um, all the scenarios, as I understand them, implicitly assume a unified West. What if that assumption is incorrect? We've just had a very fractious meeting of the G7. What if you have a political fragmentation of the West? In addition to political fragmentation, the IMF a few months ago issued a report without decisive progress to foster fiscal risk sharing, the European Economic and Monetary Union will continue to face existential risks. Okay, Ex so this was also Julia's And the question is, so what if you on. have this fragmentation for political and economic reasons, how does that affect okay. Ukraine? Great, thanks. And I think this was uh, Julia's uh, point much earlier, but Alexander, do you want to go first, please? Uh, concerning the future election and pro-Russian, to my mind, we have a great chance that next election put to the power more pro-Ukrainian forces. Because, you know, even <laughs> pro-Ukrainian, which I'm sure follow our ideas, that the most important to concentrate on real Ukrainian interests. And if this interest will be possible to realize with um, some changing the nature of our present relations with Russia, I think such questions have a chance to be put in the future. But I'm 100% sure that any pro-Ukrainian forces, which I'm sure will be in power during the next election cycle, continue pro-European integration and pro-Euro-Atlantic integration cause. Because it's a question about values. It's a first. But concerning, it's not me, you, comments that West, collect West and especially EU, if take as a separate element of collective West, now in problems, now in uncertainty. So it's more one argument that Ukraine have to concentrate on their own interests and to try to develop um, future potential for future developments inside of the country. Concerning the democracy, demo demo demography situation. Of course, it's very, very terrible. You are completely right. But to my mind, I'm sure, if Ukraine demonstrate some kind of success internally, a lot of Ukrainians return back if we create chance inside of the country. Concerning the set Maidan, you know, now practically society, civil society, um, uh, more support evolution uh, way of the future development. That Maidan, its uh, perception as more danger for country than more evolution uh, way of development. So idea of that Maidan, it's my perception. It's not very popular in Ukraine. It's a uh, nation now more wise, uh, civil society, I think, more wise. Okay, uh, Sam, you wanted to jump in? Yeah. Just to address, um, generally speaking, the question of why didn't you include X factor in this, or uh, where does X factor appear, or why didn't 
or shouldn't it appear? I mean, I think uh, you need to think about the purpose of this kind of a document and this analytical exercise as a whole. Um, this is going to be a general answer to all of these questions going forward. Uh, the purpose of this is not to document every single possible factor that could produce, uh, that could influence Ukraine's future. We did sort of start with that question, as uh, Greg mentioned. Um, but instead to, you know, we, we went through a process, we chose these factors, and we came up with these scenarios. And the challenge, I think, well, the challenge we put to you is to think about them as potential futures for Ukraine and think about which elements of them are preferable or less preferable or which ones are uh, more uh, possible to come to pass and, you know, how in terms of the preferable ones we might be able to, um, or Ukraine might be able to move in that direction. Um, so I, I don't think we're going to be able to satisfy uh, um, uh, any of the questions as to why you didn't include X factor that we didn't include, it will probably end up being a relatively similar answer. So, but I. Short on two questions. Firstly, about civilized world and efforts uh, tackling. If we take this approach further, we Ukrainians should be very highly dissatisfied with the Western approach since 2014. Because if we are too exaggerated, we should have expected, according be it bilateral agreements, Budapest Memorandum, some other document that. Russian aggression or endeavor should have been stopped or reversed immediately. It did not happen. We should be highly dissatisfied. And what? This is reality. We need to live with this reality, to come up with this reality, regardless, do we like or do we don't like. Then on military expenditures, I do agree with Olga. Official figures are approximately 6% of GDP. Military expense is too high. But nevertheless, it's not 50. And then a question about rankings. Actually, um, you're absolutely right. The latest rankings of CNIS is exactly but. The very first question we should put, how many people are really now in Ukraine? And it's the uh, trajectory for the last two, three years. If you ask the first question when you are making the polls, you ask the people, uh, are you sure that you have a candidate to vote for? And even by CNIS ranking, this ranking, 50% of the people, they answer, no, I don't. So all of the rankings you evaluate on the basis of the people who are more or less uh, defined with their choice. Plus, this is one more problem, not only for Ukraine, but for many post-Soviet space. Many people just reject to answer or to be polled. And then you just have out the quite large quota of the people who don't like to answer any questions. And then you should just somehow imagine about these rankings. Therefore, yes, we should have in, mi in mind the rankings, but uh, the general trajectory, which was exactly based on this figure, be it Karmaluk, Yaroslav Mudry, that some figures in Ukrainian, not so much political, which we have now, this is a huge demand for so-called third party or third force in Ukraine, which you could grab from all these indirect questions in the rankings. And that's why in some scenarios we put exactly this option that which might happen, so-called third figure, if some circumstances will be in place. And therefore, it's, for, for me, it's a huge question because, okay, somebody tells it's a good about democracy, you don't know the result of the elections, yes, it's okay, but sometimes it could be counterproductive, which you are in absolutely mess, not understanding what will happen. And for Ukraine, having two elections at once in 2019, both presidential and parliamentary, will be a crucial change which in all of the scenarios, this is exactly the case, that this will be some kind of turning point in Ukraine's development. And we tried just to propose, to offer exactly, to provoke discussion what the developments could be like, the major trajectories. It's absolutely not the recipe that it will be like we suggested, but nevertheless, we tried. Okay, I think we are out of time. I don't know how much time the participants have to speak to you in person after this, but I think we are gonna have to close this. I believe there's a, a sign-up list going around in the audience, so there was also a check-in list, but if uh, the sign-up list is going around, please uh, get that to Reinhardt, and please join me in thanking our panelists and um, for both presenting this really interesting work and Julia's case for providing a really nice uh, beginning to the commentary on it. Thank you. Thank you.